Welcome to Travels Free Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. Hello, I'm Peter Moore. There's nowhere on earth quite like New York City. Today, we're going back to the early 19th century to catch New York at a dramatic moment in its development. In the early 19th century, the United States was the modern world's fastest growing power. And of all its cities, the one that was developing on Manhattan Island was the most formidable of all. Superbly placed with easy access to the open sea and the continental interior, people could quickly see New York's potential. Making the dream a reality, however, was a much more complicated business. Today the writer and native New Yorker Daniel Levy takes us back to the 1830s to have a look at a city that has always fascinated him. He introduces us to a diarist, an abolitionist, and he describes one great catalytic moment, the fire of 1835. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I'll begin by saying a warm welcome to the podcast, Daniel Levy, and we're going to be talking about your new book, Manhattan Phoenix, over the next hour or so. And I thought I'd begin this conversation by asking you a personal question about your career as a journalist, an investigative journalist, or maybe uh, branching into literary projects like books as well. Could you tell us a little bit about your professional career, please? I actually never planned to become a journalist. I was going to be an architect. I went, did my undergraduate at NYU as an American history major. And actually, when I was there, NYU was in, located in Washington Square in the Greenwich Village, part of New York. And I guess when I was a freshman or so, I found out that through the park, they used to run something called the Minetta Brook. At one point, started about 21st Street and flowed through the park and then headed west to the Hudson River. And I became fascinated by the fact that this urban city was once quite rural and wild. And I studied that. And I I worked one summer at the Museum of London, the Department of Urban Archaeology. They used to have these excavations in downtown London. And I was in a in a excavation near St. Paul's, uh, where there was, there used to be a British telegraph office, which the Luftwaffe leveled, and been abandoned site, I guess, for decades. And they were about to build there. And they found out that there was Roman, Saxon, medieval, Victorian ruins there. And they did this salvage excavation. And I was just turned, I was 18. I went, I worked there for part of the summer. And I soon after worked on the uh, installation, the American wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They did this huge new wing back in the in the late seventies, and I did some rest. You know, I was I was a kid basically, but they gave me work to do. I did restoration, and when I graduated from NYU, I started a master's in historic preservation at Columbia School of Architecture. I planned to get a joint degree in architecture and preservation, and right before I started there, I got a part time job at Time Magazine in the art department. Back when you could work one, two days a week and get full benefits, and they paid for Columbia. And I became fascinated by this place, by Time Magazine. And when I graduated, um, I became a reporter. I became the architecture and design reporter, and I spent 15 years, 15 more years at the magazine. I went off to our sister publications, People. I'm now at the books division. It's now, of course, no longer Time Inc. It's now Dot Dash Meredith, but I've been in the same place for 38 years. But I I have this fascination in architecture and design and preservation. I'm fascinated by how cities change and evolve. And of course, for me, the main interest is my hometown of New York City. And I, I would while I was at the magazine, I would do freelance work on, on New York history, on things like the building of the Croton Aqueduct or what the city looked like when George Washington was president. Because New York was the first capital. People don't realize New York was the first capital of the United States. And it's just been a lifelong interest of mine. Yeah, it's um, the, the words you open the book with are, as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by my hometown. 
Um, I suppose in a way we're all fascinated by New York City because it's such a unique space. I mean, I'm, I remember seeing New York for the first time coming out of the subway and looking up at the Empire State Building and thinking, wow, am I on a film set? Where am I? This, is, this, this place actually exists because we see it from afar. And then, of course, you can see it close up and it's just as impressive in a way. Well, what to you, what is this fascination? What's the source of this fascination with New York City? It's just my childhood playground. Um, you know, I grew up, I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in a section of Queens called Forest Hills Gardens, which um, is actually an Olmsted Brothers. Olmsted was the designer of Central Park, famous American landscape architect. And it's a small, very leafy community in New York. Not, it's the opposite, polar opposite of, of Manhattan. It's like some of those leafy, very nice communities, I guess you have in London. They were from the, the 18th, 19th century. And I actually grew up in a, the house I grew up in was designed, it was the home of Adolf Wyman. There were two sister houses. There was uh, the house and next door was the studio. And Wyman is known as, he was one of the main uh, neoclassical sort of Beaux-Arts period sculptors. He did all the statuary in the in Pennsylvania Station, the Great Penn Station, which they, of course, unfortunately knocked down in the 1960s. He did things like the Mercury Dime, the Walking Liberty Half Dollar, stuff in the Supreme Court, stuff throughout New York. And uh, I actually studied uh, sculpture with his son when I was younger, uh, back in my early 20s. So I have this personal connection. I'd walk around town. I could see things by the fellow who used to live in my home, the statuary around the city. It was just this wonderful, this wonderful city, which, which was very orderly you know, with the grid pattern, but at the same time, there's this wonderful disorder to it. I, I think there's an interesting dynamic here with, with New York City because because when you see it and you have that first encounter, it seems so, it's, it's almost futuristic, I suppose, that the idea that it has a past is is instantly appealing. And then this challenge of, of taking away the layers to get into that history seems to be at the heart of your book, which is set over this really interesting period in the first... Well, I suppose it starts in the 1820s and moves through towards the Civil War, which you've identified as an absolutely crucial time in New York City's development. Do you want to just like kind of sketch a bit about what happened in that time and why this particular time frame interests you quite so much? This was a time of just when New York really went from being a sort of a large, unruly community to a really large, unruly uh, metropolis. And so many of the changes which came about in this quarter century or so prior and leading up through the Civil War affected how New York grew and really set up New York. Because you have to remember, at this point, New York City was just Manhattan. People don't realize that. There was not the five boroughs, which you have Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. That didn't come out about until 1898, which was the consolidation of New York. But so much that happened at this point really set up the possibility of more than half a century later, for New York becoming greater New York. And you had all these forces that were going on that were the city that people were battling with, you know, from from bad water and disease and riots and what have you. Solutions or plans which were set in, in motion at this point really set up New York to really evolve and change and make all this possible. You have you had horrible water systems. You know, if you think about New York, New York is a, is Manhattan is a city that's surrounded, it's it's bordered by these two massive rivers, the East River and the, the Hudson River. But there was really a lack of really drinkable water in the city. And this was a long-term battle to try to find water from digging wells to bringing, you know, to people bringing carts down with, you know, with water to deliv- deliver to people. And you have in the mid-1830s, they decided we finally have to do something about this. And they started to build the Croton Reservoir, the Croton Aqueduct, which was which was to build this massive reservoir upstate, up near the Croton River, which would then bring water uh, 40 miles south to New York City. And this was done for various reasons. You know, New York was, as with many cities at the point, was built of wood. A lot of it was wooden construction. And there were just massive fires which ripped through the city constantly. You have, you know, there was a great fire in 1776, right after the British occupied Manhattan. And it was possibly set off by some... American revolutionaries ended up burning down 500 buildings. This is in the in the fall of 1776. You have just other fires. You read through newspapers at this point, and they were, you know, they would have this, you know, 
huge conflagration you know fire which burnt down 72 buildings and 100 people are homeless and this went on constantly and you have of course in 1835 in the year they decided to do to build the reservoir you have which my book partly revolves around which is the great fire of 1835 which burnt down 674 buildings you also had because of lack of water and lack of really an understanding of medicine you had major plagues which would which would sweep through the city. And this was not only a problem of New York, of course, London had it. A lot of places have it. You had yellow fever in the 18th century and in, into the 19th century. And of course, you had cholera. And the first major cholera epidemic arrived in New York in 1832. It swept through Asia. It killed hundreds of thousands of people in Europe. And it arrived in, in New York in 1832. And people had no idea how to deal with this. But there was always a sense that, you know, the city is kind of filthy. We have to get proper water systems here. Um, you have lack of sanitation. This was a whole problem. You had pigs running through the streets. You know, Charles Dickens came to visit New York in 1842. And he wrote, I think he wrote in his American notes, you know, beware of beware of pigs. Because there were pigs always running around. They were, they were, you know, looking for food in a certain way. People hated the pigs, but they were some of the best sanitation systems we had because they were actually eating and getting rid of a lot of the filth that was in the city. You have, at this point, you have, this is the beginning, this is really uh, Jacksonian era, which is kind of very populism, which, we, you know, we think of nowadays, populism in America has gone sort of, you know, it, it's it's wild. This goes back into the early part of our of our republic. And you had changes in the New York State Constitution which expanded suffrage. And instead of have, being allowed to vote if you owned property or you had a certain amount of money, it essentially opened up the vote to any white male above 21. And so all of a sudden you had these young Jacksonian, you know, workers, you know, these sort of, you know, by the bootstraps sort of guys who wanted to make it, you know, have a say in their society and how things were run. And so you have a change here from this very patrician, wealthy New Yorkers running the place to very much becoming more democratic and, as a result, wilder. You have actually riots, election riots, uh, in 1834 because they had the first popular election for mayor. And for a couple of days, you had people, you know, rampaging through the streets and attacking the Whigs, attacking the Democrats, the Democrats attacking the Whigs. You also, of course, have anti-slavery riots. There was a major abolitionist riot at the same time, a few months later after the election riot, where people seem to forget that New York was really the center or helped the southern um, cotton trade. Because so much of the cotton would pass through New York and go off to Britain and go off to Asia. And then, of course, supplies would then come back through New York and then make their way down to the south. And one southern journal predicted at one point that New Yorkers made 40 cents on every dollar of cotton. It was a major, it was a major transportation hub in that way. So there were these great ties to the South. New York was very much of a Southern city in that sense. And you see that especially at the start of the Civil War. As the Civil War was coming up, you have these these different forces competing, you know, who, in a sense, what side should we be on? And just before Fort Sumter, Mayor Fernando Wood, who was very pro-South, actually called for New York to secede from the Union and become a separate state. And that way we could, we could, be above it all, above this fight between the North and the South. And of course, we could still make lots of money. There was a really nice quote that you used um, from James Fenimore Cooper when he comes from upstate New York and sees the city for the first time. And I think he has this impression that a lot of people do when they're kind of bowled over by the geography. And he says, it's only necessary to sit down with a minute map of the country before you perceive at a glance that nature herself has intended the island of Manhattan for the site of one of the greatest commercial towns in the world. I, I, it seemed to me what you do in the book is, that, well, the, the vision is obvious. The geography is clear. Anyone who maybe sails into New York Harbour is going to be impressed. But there's some severe practical difficulties that you have to encounter if you are going to make this make this dream a reality. Things, as you said, like water supply, things like dealing with the diseases that come in and so on. So that's, I suppose, to me, the heart of, the heart of your book. And um, we're now going to kind of Follow the format of the podcast, which um, means giving you the opportunity to take us back to one specific calendar year within the bounds of your story. So I'll hand it over to you with the question, um, if you could travel back through time to New York, which year would you like to have a look at? I would like to look at 1835, which is actually the year of the Great Fire. But so much that happened in that year really had just massive 
effect on New York and how New York evolved. And it very much talks about a lot of the forces that were at play, not only in New York, but across around the country. So if we're thinking about 1835, for example, how big was the city by this point? I know that you said that, oh, I don't know, was it still walkable at this point? Was it still clustered on that southern shore of Manhattan around Wall Street where you had all the docks and so on? Or had it really started to venture upwards into the old country, uh, the countryside that maybe was around in the revolutionary days, for example? It had started to venture up, but still it was very much in the southern part of the city. Um, New York in the town fathers in the early part of the century decided we have this city, we want it to develop. And in 1811, commissioners decided to basically map out the city and they decided to build a grid. And the grid, they figured, was the easiest thing. We don't want this, you know, fancy European, you know, like L'Enfant did for Washington or, or Paris had, would, would have. They basically did a, a north-south grid uh, with streets going east-west. This was a massive project, and it went up to 155th Street at that point, which actually was not even the top of Manhattan. And the sense that, you know, people thought it was just, it was ridiculous to plan out this far, because, you know, you're planning for, for more people than they have in China, they, they felt. But it had been laid out, but it then was slowly, it slowly ro- got rolled out over the years. They would, they would create the avenues and they would actually create the streets more east-west uh, first. And there were more streets than there were avenues because there was very much interested in trade and the trade had to go to the rivers. So you have the Hudson on the west side, you have the, the, the East River on the, obviously the east side. The grid actually started on Houston Street. Um, so you, and then above that, you have first, second, third. You have uh, different villages still in the city. You have places like Greenwich Village, of course, which people st- still know and they still love. You had communities like Harlem, which is all the way uptown in, in the in the hundreds. You had places like Manhattanville, and which is even further uptown. And the island, a lot of the island at, back at this point, still had farms on it and manor houses, and it still had streams and you know marshes. Habitable New York. It's probably above 14th Street was still, you know, was still quite rural at the time. And uh, you have downtown, you have, you know, things are developing, but it's slowly pushing up there. And, you know, people were developing it. But, you know, if you think about it, New York at the time of the fire was probably maybe up to 14th Street. And by the time of the Civil War, you have people, you know, pushing up towards Central Park, which is in the 60s. So you have maybe a four-mile period during this point of this phenomenal growth that's going on. But in the 1820s and 30s, the city was still very much downtown. You said a lot of the buildings were made out of wood, so presumably they wouldn't have been too, I don't know, enduring. No, they weren't. And there was very much of a sense that a lot of the colonial buildings were vanishing. You have Walt Whitman, our great bard, who who actually was bemoaning a lot of the destruction that was going on. There were buildings where, you know, the British had held prisoners, which was being were being knocked down the Sugar House warehouse and places like that. Trinity Church, you know, people think of Trinity Church of Wall Street and at the western edge of, of Wall Street on Broadway is Trinity Church. That building was actually built in 1846, which is afterwards. Of course, the second Trinity Church, which was on the spot, which was built following the Great Fire uh, of 1776, was still there. And it was kind of dilapidated at that point. But this is a building which was just post-American Revolution. You had, you know, you had Dutch, some Dutch farmhouses. Of course, you had the manor houses that were dotted throughout the island. Nowadays, there's almost nothing. You have da- in downtown, you have, just thinking of it, there's St. Paul's, which dates from 1763, where Washington would go to church uh, when he was... Uh, president but there there wasn't really a lot of the stuff was just falling at the wayside the one building that i always um uh, when i look at maps of the 18th century in new york they have fort george down at the bottom with this enormous union i don't know if this is just for an effect i'm not sure but they, it always seems to have a very large union jack on obviously the union jack has gone by 1835 I, I i don't even know what happened to that building but that was the i suppose military center for well, the British, at least during their colonial period. And, and did that go? That was all gone. There was there was a Dutch fort there initially. Then when the British took over Manhattan in 1664, the Duke of York came in, of course, became New York. They had their fortress down there. That site is now, I'm pretty sure that's where the Customs House is, which is this massive 
Beaux-Arts building. It's by uh, Cass Gilbert. And your listeners might know Cass Gilbert as the designer of the George Washington Bridge and the Woolworth building. The Woolworth building is the center of magic in the new Harry Potter uh, films. Uh, this is where American American magicians have their headquarters. And that's the Woolworth building. It's grand 1920s or so gothic skyscraper was once i think the tallest building in the world so fort george which was down at the southern end is gone above that of course you had bowling green where there was a statue of george the third and um, when the revolution started we decided to pull it down and they melted down the statue and turned it into bullets and a few loyalists saved pieces of it and squirreled them away and i think George's head might be in some museum now. I love that story, the fact that they melt, melted down the statue of King George, turned it into bullets, and then shot them at redcoat soldiers. So it's a wonderful story. I could I could talk to you um, about these buildings all day, but let's, let's dive into the streets in 1835 um, for these three different scenes. Um, what would you like to go to first in 1835, please? I thought, because we, we spoke about abolitionism and the whole fight over slavery. And you have to also remember that we had slavery in the United States up until the Civil War. And of course, the Emancipation Proclamation freed all the slaves in the the areas of of rebellion and eventually slavery was abolished in the United States in the 1860s. But different states abolished slavery at different points. And New York had slavery until 1827. And it was finally abolished in on July 4th, 1827. But African-Americans wouldn't celebrate it until July 5th because they felt that if they were celebrating July 4th, they might incur the wrath of you know, slave-loving New Yorkers and they would be attacked on the streets. So you have slavery abolished in 1827, but in the, the position of African-Americans in New York was still was the bottom of the rung, I guess you could say. And most blacks who, who worked and lived in New York had menial jobs. They were laborers, they were domestics. Uh, some of them would, would become corkers. They would have, they would have good, tr- they would learn good trades and what have you, but most of them when not, they were quite impoverished. There was a growing, uh, throughout this period, throughout the, the early 19th century, growing abolitionist movement to free slaves. And one of the main proponents and supporters of it was a fellow named Arthur Tappan. Arthur and Lewis Tappan, Lewis was his younger brother, were two wealthy silk merchants who had a uh, silk uh, business downtown. And silks, you don't think of it nowadays, you think of nice ties and scarves and what have you, but this was big business and they were wealthy. They were sort of Jeff Bezos sort of wealthy. They were worth tens in current dollars, tens and tens of billions of dollars. And they were evangelicals and they believe very much in good works and trying to free society of all its ills. And they gave lots of money to various groups, one of them being abolitionism and the freedom of slaves. What they what they could do at this point was they they basically they realized they had they, they needed laws to change it, but they felt they had to change the hearts and minds of slave owners and people who supported slavery. And of course you had the year before, you had a major riot in New York attacking abolitionists. For three days, there were people rioting through the streets. There was fear that the abolitionists were supporting amalgamation, which was the intermarriage of whites and blacks, which to people, was this was a horrifying idea. And they attacked black churches, black homes. They tried to attack uh, Tappan's business down on Pearl Street. And actually, Tappan had his workers inside, I think, with 36 muskets, you know, basically saying, OK, boys, if they break through, shoot them in the legs. That way they can't and come and attack us. And they eventually, they realized they couldn't get into tap-in store, so they went elsewhere and they tr- they pulled down black churches. And there was just, there was just rioting in the streets. And of course, they also destroyed Tappan's brother's home, Lewis Tappan. And they went in and they burnt the house down. At one point, they were about to burn a Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington. And somebody screamed, you can't, you can't burn the portrait of our president. And they, they raised it up and they marched off with it and it vanished, of course. But in 1833, the, a lot of abolitionists formed the American Anti-Slavery Society. And of course, in Britain, you abolished, you had the Anti-Slavery Act of 1833, which basically got rid of slavery in, in most of your colonies. And they wanted to do something similar here. They decided to start a campaign to change the hearts and minds of people. And it was called the Postal Campaign. And it was basically set off on 
May 12th, 1835, at a church on Houston and Thompson Street. If you, and if you want to know, Houston is basically where the grid starts. The grid that was started in 1811. It was the Bay Street, so above it you have 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street. And to give you a sense of, of where it is, the church was maybe four blocks south of where Washington Square Park is. Washington Square Park, of course, was developed around this time too, in the 1820s. So this is going into Greenwich Village and this area is being developed. And they decided to start a postal campaign to, in the words of one of the members, to sow the good seed of abolition. And there was a small meeting at this church and Lewis Tappan uh, was there and Amos uh, Phelps was another major abolitionist preacher was there and they had four simple resolutions and I will read you two of them. One of them, that the society earnestly request that ladies in every section of the land organize themselves into anti-slavery societies and sewing or other associations for the purpose of cooperating with us in the great work of emancipation. Another thing was that they wanted to try to get the hearts and minds of children. And they did. They earnestly desire that children in all parts of the country may encourage to form themselves into societies. That children who are free may thus aid in emancipating the children of this land who are now slaves. And this is mid-1835. Um, this is a year after major riots. And they started this campaign. And the American Anti-Slavery Society had a base number of uh, publications, the main one being The Emancipated. And they were kind of dry, boring sort of things, but they decided to, to really rev up the production of, of publications. And they printed, I think, 175,000, which were distributed in no time in the South. They would send the stuff down to southern cities. They would send down copies of The Emancipator, The Anti-Slavery Record, Slave's Friend, which was the children's magazine, and Human Rights. And they encouraged women at this point to, to create pink cushions, uh, with showing, you know, images of, you know, freeing slaves and things to cover work boxes. And they encouraged children to save pennies and what have you. And by the end of July, they had 175,000 copies sent to the South. It's, I can see why it's attractive for a choice because you, you have essentially this moral crusade and it's kind of moving forward. Did, did Tapan see himself very much as the inheritor or someone who's taken the baton from um, Wilberforce and Clarkson and these kind of characters? Were they interconnected, sorry? Did they correspond with each other? Where, where, where did this abolitionist passion come from that Tapan had? As a child, there was a neighbour, a slave, a uh, black woman, elderly black woman, who was uh, very kind. He used to give him little treats and pieces of cakes and what have you. And he grew up in this very sort of um, evangelical family, a huge family of like 12 or more children. And his, his mother, Sarah, was very much sort of, you have to do good, you have to do right. And they were just, they were brought up that you had to make a change in society. You had to really change people and bring them up, obviously, to, to God. So this was something which which was very much his growing up and of course you have to realize you had these 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 religious revivals which swept these great awakenings which had swept through America at this point which was affecting you know people like Tappan which was affecting businessmen and just church ladies and what have you lots of people and it, but it wasn't only abolition it was to try to end things like prostitution to end you know drinking to end just you know battering of wives with just you had to you basically had to you know basically change society from it from its core and so much of this you know the whole idea say of, of drinking was so much tied into into abolitionism yeah. because you had to, you had to be you had to be clear headed get rid of get rid of this satan drink and bring you know fresh water in. yeah it's quite it's quite similar we had this uh, thing in britain but earlier on probably around the year 1800 for the the society for the prevention of vice which is a wonderful <laughs> wonderful name for a society that once read but um yeah it seems to be connected to that that same movement which is really um really interesting the second question i had about tappan in this information campaign that he embarks on which is really interesting in itself but uh, it's a bit fraught with danger someone from new york sending moral instruction down to the south i can imagine today that would be a bit dangerous as well <laughs> how does it go in 1835 it didn't go well. They they started this, of course, was set off in May. In July, they sent down a packet ship um, called the Columbia down to Charleston. And some locals found out that there were these bags of mail con containing these pamphlets. 
and they snuck into the, into the post office and basically grabbed them. And there was a massive bonfire. I think the following day, two to three thousand people gathered around as they burnt this stuff. They made effigies of of Tappan and of William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison was one of the major voices against slavery. He had started just four years earlier a newspaper called The Liberator, which became basically the the most famous of the anti-slavery papers. And they, they made effigies of Tappan and Garrison and hung them in effigy and burnt them. There were anti-abolitionist rallies and people uh, marching through the streets and there were societies being formed, which were, there was one called the Louisiana Constitutional Anti-Fanatical Society. Uh, there were bounties placed on their head. I think a $50,000 bounty was placed on Arthur Tappan's head. And I think he quipped, well, for that much money, maybe I'll turn myself in and we'll use the money for good cause. But, and there was, there was real fear. Of course, you had these, these, these bounties and these fears and you have the Richmond, the Whig newspaper complaining how, you know, Tappan has inflamed the South. You know, we have to get this scoundrel and what have you. And the mayor of Brooklyn actually sent patrols around because Tappan had moved this point to Brooklyn. I think it was Brooklyn Heights just to patrol around his house. And there were calls for kidnapping. And Lydia Maria Child, who, who edited the National Anti-Slavery Standard, who you don't probably remember that paper, but she's also the author of Over the River and Through the Woods to Grandmother's House We Go. She wrote that, which I don't know if you know that in Britain, but it's big here in America. She talked about how it was felt like the times of the French Revolution and there was fears of just, you know, the riots going on throughout the, st the city. And you had black abolitionists being attacked. David Ruggles was a was a butter merchant who actually had a abolitionist library. And he was he worked for the uh, Vigilance Committee, which was a group of black activists who basically watched out for the rights of black New Yorkers because there was there was kidnapping of blacks going on. So basically free blacks were being grabbed off the streets as well as blacks who might have escaped from slavery and basically sold back into slavery. And of course, there's that movie a few years ago, 12 Years a Slave, which is exactly about, about this topic. They were, the, the people who did this were called blackbirders and they would make money. And of course, you know, you had the courts, which in a way encourage it because they can easily give out a subpoena to grab some guy. And they were without, without, with minimal legal oversight, these people were packed up in shackles and shipped back south. So it was very much, and Ruggles store was actually torched at this point. And William Lloyd Garrison was in Boston at one point giving a speech against slavery and a mob grabbed him and looped a noose around his neck and paraded him through the streets. Unfortunately, the mayor sent the police there to basically arrest or capture Garrison and lock him in jail to keep him safe. It was just, it was a very scary period. And there was there were rumors in the papers that there were boats and ships off the shore, you know, off, ready to grab Tappan and bring him down to trial. And of course, Tappan was this, you know, at this point, he was in his 50s, 60s or so. And a lot of people would actually go by his store. And, you know, they they figured they would see this, you know, this horrible guy with horns and what have you. And they see this grandfatherly like character, you know, in his counting house, you know, selling silks. And he was this very sort of low key uh, sort of fellow. But of course, his, 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 what he was trying to do for them was just horrifying. Is he a figure that's well known today, Tappan, or is he passed a bit out of popular history? I mean, all this seems, seems very, it's a, it's a foreshadowing event for what happens, obviously, quarter of a century later. You can see these dynamics really solidifying already um, in the pre-Civil War generation. Um, but, but what about him today? Is he thought about? Is he part of that story? No, he's he's generally not remembered the the he was quite wealthy but in a certain way the postal campaign and of course the fire afterwards um really hurt his business and a lot of businessmen in the south didn't want to do business with him anymore and as a result he had to extend credit to get people to buy his silks and of course you have just two years later you have the panic of 1837 which was this massive international depression and he you had uh, businesses folding right and left, and he was able to stay in business because he was considered such a reliable businessman, but people extended credit to him. But basically his business by the 1840s had faltered. His brother though, Lewis, at this point started a credit rating business. If you wanted to do business in the city, people, you had to give letters of recommendation saying I'm reliable, I pay my bills. There was no sort of national way to sort of 
check on things. And he started this business which sent out people to different cities and he had people in the city send back reports on Mr. Moore's business is quite reliable. Yes, extend him the credit, what have you. And Arthur went into business with Lewis and of course Lewis then sold out the business uh, about a decade later and it evolved into what's now known as Dun & Bradstreet. Which is a major uh, credit rating yeah. business. But it's, it, I think if you, it's nice as well if you follow these threads right back to the early 19th century and you arrive at this kind of slightly low-key little guy in his shop who's um, creating all of this bustle. It's almost, it, you've, it is, it's almost like a, he's a good character for a novel. Maybe if Dickens was there, he could have been quite a Dickensian um, creation yeah. in a way. It's a nice thought. Let's keep going, though, because we've got um, two more scenes to pass through. I think that's a really good one. But why are you going to take us next? I thought I would start with a fellow named George Templeton Strong, who was 15 years old. He was entering his uh, sophomore year at Columbia College. You think of Columbia now as this massive university. It's uptown. It's in Harlem. Uh, Columbia at the time in the 1830s had 100 students. It was located down on the west side uh, to the west of City Hall on Park Place. And George Templeton Strong was a was starting his sophomore year and he started a diary. And he kept on writing this diary until 1875. And he is known now as one of the major one of the major 19th century diarists of New York. The other one being Philip Hone, who was of his father's generation. The families knew each other. Uh, Philip Hone was a mayor of New York for one year in the 1820s, very patrician, sort of, you know, old line in New York. Uh, made a lot of money in the auction business. Good friend of the Astors, John Jacob Astor. You have here this young man. He lived at on Greenwich Street, which is just to the west of Trinity Church. This is the previous Trinity Church, not the one we have now. He lived at 108 Greenwich Street, and he was the um, son of George Washington Strong and Eliza Strong. George Washington Strong was an early lawyer in New York, and his firm is the oldest surviving firm now in New York. It's now called Cadwallader, Wickensham, and Taft. It's one of those very sort of white shoe, you know, New York law firms. And he starts at quite his diary on October 5th, 1835. It's very simple. He's a 15 year old kid and he basically wrote, Monday, cloudy and raining, went to college at half past. So he would write about at this point his college days and it's basically a kid's diary at this point. You know, he writes about his friends, his, his boring classes, the classes he likes, his fascination with old coins. He was a coin collector. And but he evolved and this diary evolved and he became this very um, well-known lawyer who would handle the, the business, would handle the, the, the accounts of Aaron Burr, who, of course, you know, is having killed Alexander Hamilton, of the Astors, of others. And he focused on real estate, on probate and um, things like that. And he was very much a chronicle of life in New York. He would write about politics. Of He was obsessed with fires. He would run out to see fires all the time. Riots in the streets, you know, the visits of people like Charles Dickens and uh, Jenny Lind, who was this famous soprano who came for this grand tour in America. She was the Swedish nightingale that P.T. Barnum brought over. And it was this huge, very successful tour. And he did this diary. But of course, in 1835, he was a 15-year-old kid who was at Columbia College. And if you think about Columbia at this point, it took up maybe a few city blocks. It was uh, between Park and Murray and Barclay Streets and Church Street. And it had sycamore trees on it. And there was a three and a half story building, which is where Alexander Hamilton went to school when he was a student. And Hamilton's son, actually James Alexander Hamilton, was there. He graduated in 1805. It's a good choice. I think in London, we have Samuel Pepys we always talk about. And he's a touchstone for the 17th century because... He has this ability to be in the right place at the right time, which is a very, very useful um, thing for a historian to uh, make use of later on. Did did he have that same ability? It seems like th there's a few things. He There was his longevity, as you say. He was there. He knew, I think you describe, he knew um, New York as a small town, a community settled um on the edge of the wilds, a place of sylvan hills and valleys of fleeting streams and dense marshes, marshes. So he knew that New York, but then he also saw it 50 years later when the, you know, the tall buildings were beginning to, to, to go up. So that's his, his longevity. But is, uh, 
was there a particular quality to his prose that really attracted him? Was he a descriptive writer? He was descriptive. He was sharp. He, suppose he was a very sort of, you know, calm, very just laid back sort of fellow. If you met him, I guess, in person, but he could be quite biting in his descriptions. Um, and you, you see changes also of him. I mean, you talk about abolitionism. You know, he was very much this old school, you know, New Yorker at a point, and, you know, blacks were the sort of the underclass. And you see it evolving in his diary, his change, how he started to view blacks differently. And of course, he, he helped form one of the first black regiments that fought in the Civil War, his, his Union Club, helped form one of the first black regiments, which went off to fight uh, against the South. He, of course, he also was one of the founders of the United States Sanitary Commission, which became the American Red Cross, which during the Civil War basically would bring medical care and aid to soldiers because there was, there was no you know, medical care back then was you'd amputate a guy's limb and hopefully the guy would live. And there was bad transportation, what have you. And the American Sanitary Commission basically took over a lot of responsibilities from the military of bringing ships down to bring soldiers back to get the medical care, to bring doctors and nurses to the front. And actually, uh, George Templeton Strong's wife actually worked on one of the boats during, Ellen, she worked on one of the boats during the, um, one of the campaigns in the South as a nurse. And one of, of course, the other fellows who helped found it was uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who had been building Central Park at this point, but he was, he was known as a man who could organize massive amount of workers, you know, thousands and thousands of workers. And he was visiting battlefields as as did Strong to check on, you know, were supplies getting there to try to get supplies to get, you know, to make sure there were enough doctors and what have you and to get the men back from the front and get them to, to, to hospitals in New York and in Washington and elsewhere. So it's a major source for the, the times. And I'd, I didn't, am I right in saying that his diary wasn't discovered until much later, mid 20th century, that kind of thing? It was, it was the family diary. I think it was probably under somebody's bed at some point. And it was loaned, it was, it was given for a loan at an exhibition. And eventually it was published by um, a much cut down version of the diary because it was like two and a half million words. But there's a four volume diary uh, which came out in the, in the 1950s. And of course you have also, Hone's diary, which came out in the in the nineteen twenties, and then a newer edition came out similar. So you have these two diaries in the twentieth century, uh, early part of the twentieth century, which all of a sudden became available for people to read to learn about this. And um, the diary, the strong diary, starts a few years, I think, just after the the entry that I read, because it was just kind of nothing entry. But it 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 starts in the in just a few months later. And of course, he then writes briefly about the fire that swept through New York right quite close to his house, which is one of the other dates which I would like to talk about. Hi there, it's Peter here. UnseenHistories.com is now three months old, and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating, and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester, and Gary Shaw's Egyptian Mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. UnseenHistories.com Well, listen, let's let's go. All roads are heading to this one particular date, um, which is the one which I suppose colours your book more than anything. So for the third scene, where shall we go to, please? Well, this is downtown where we've been discussing New York. It's, of course, the Wall Street area. And it's the evening of December 16th, 1835. And it was a bitterly cold month. And you have people like Philip Hone in his diary and you have George Templeton Strong in his diary talking about how the thermometer is all the way down and the Erie Canal, which was started a decade, uh, 10 years earlier, had frozen and nothing was passing through and the East River was frozen. You couldn't you couldn't move around. And that evening, there was a huge um, nor'easter blowing through the city. The, the temperature was down to zero. 
below zero, I should say. And a small fire started on Merchant Street in a merchant's house, Comstock and Andrew's house. You have to remember there were no police forces that really at this point. They had the, the city watch, which one of their jobs was really to watch out for fires. And you had these um, two watch members who smelled smoke. They went over and they opened the door and to Comstock and Andrew's and there was this massive blaze and they quickly closed it. Uh, word of the fire had to get out and you had, you know, basically church bells. You had a, you had a, a, a watcher in City Hall who would sit up there looking for fires and they had a different way of ringing bells to tell the firemen where to go which ward it was in and where it about to go. And you had firemen within no time, within 10, 15 minutes who had arrived on the site. But this fire quickly, even before they got there, basically burst through the ceilings and the roof of the building and spread. You have within half an hour, you had 50 buildings burning all around. And the firemen, you have a lack of water, which we discussed. Um, of course, the reservoir wasn't built until 1842. So there was a small reservoir and, and cisterns, which they used, and there were hydrants, which they would pump. But unfortunately, there were two big fires the night before, which basically exhausted the water supply. So you had them attempting to, to tap pumps and of course you don't have modern firefighting equipment the way we have it now you basically had these these fire engines which were small things we, we call brakes which were levers on each side and you would have half dozen men on each side basically pumping as fast as they can to build a pressure to shoot water and the water the wind was so strong that it was basically blowing the wind the water back into their face you had some firemen who would go down to the east river and they had to they basically pulled the the fire engine onto the ice broke through the ice and would pump through it and other fire companies and Hose companies would link their hoses and snake them through the street to try to bring water to this fire. It was basically uncontrollable and it started to spread really fast. And you had merchants racing down there to, to see what was happening. Uh, one of them, of course, you had George Washington Strong, which was George Templeton's dad, who had his business on Wall Street. And somebody had come by and say, you know, Mr. Strong, you need to go to your office. And he quickly got there with other workers. And they, they saved some papers and what have you. And they got out what they could. Other merchants were emptying their businesses as fast as they could. And they were trying to find safe places to put the goods you had you know silk merchants and others bringing out you know boxes and crates of goods and wines and teas and what have you and there were a number of safe places one of them which was the dutch church which was just to the north of wall street because it had i think four foot wide stone walls and the other one which was the merchants exchange which was on wall street it was a major center for trading and what have you and they they put stuff into the into the trading room arthur tappan had his silk uh, store on hanover square which was on the western side uh pearl street ran through hanover square and when he got there the fire the building was on fire and the, the business the workers were frantically pulling out merchandise and you actually have local African Americans who didn't work for him but rushed over to help him to help the business of their the man who was trying to end slavery and they were rushing in and you know risking their lives to pull out stuff and Tappan had the stock that he could get out moved to uh, a friend's business and eventually had to move it again because that building was was burnt down and but you had other merchants who were basically putting this stuff into the middle of Hanover Square which was you know, where Tappan store was. And one of the people who came down was Philip Hone, the, um, the diarist, former mayor, who had a, his son had a business there and he was helping his son bring out goods. And this massive pile of, of boxes and crates and furniture and what have you was built up in the middle of Hanover Square. And all of a sudden, the wind blew flames into the square and in no time, everything just went up in, in a puff of flames. You've got some really, I mean, the... the primary source material that you've collected to describe this is really affecting. There's one which I, I plucked out. What a sight now presented itself. This is from a man called Dissosway, is that right? An ocean of fire, as it were, with rolling, roaring, burning waves, surging onwards and upward, and spreading certain universal destruction, tottering walls and falling chimneys with black smoke, hissing, crashing sounds on every side it's just that kind of overwhelming sense of confusion i suppose but then there's this as you describe it the the, the, the strange thing is that there's the cold and the heat at the same time in competition with one another so as they're trying to put put the fire out with the hoses the hoses are frozen they were soaking blankets in in water if they could find it in snow and what have you and they put them against windows but it was so hot you had you know you had 
gutters and leaders and you know zinc roofs melting and pouring off you know buildings you had people who maybe had metal shutters on the buildings which were just melting all over and then you started to have warehouses along the east river which were filled with saltpeter and other combustibles which just started to explode and the ground was rocking. These things were just shooting up colored flames from all the different chemicals, turpentine and other stuff flowing into the river. And actually the water, the river was burning if you looked at it. And you had shippers frantically trying to pull their ships away from the docks and get them to safety. They didn't really know what to do. They basically, at one point, uh, James Gullock, who was the fire chief, just basically told his firemen, help merchants uh, save the goods because their hoses were frozen. They were lying across the ground like logs and you couldn't even run over them because you'd break your wheels and what have you. And you have you have them trying to just save goods. And you had places like the Dutch church, which was um, seen as a safe place. It eventually went up into in flames and everything was lost inside. You have the merchants exchange, which people had just stocked stuff into, uh, which burnt down um, and collapsed. Um, there was a sense of just dread. Could you tell us two things? How long did the fire burn for? And what kind of area was destroyed, if you can put that into some kind of modern terms for us? Um, the fire burnt, the main fire burnt for 10 hours. Uh, of course, there were still flames going on two, three days later because you had pockets of flames and things would just start up again. And New York was lucky that you had firemen from Brooklyn and elsewhere who came to help because the, the firemen were just utterly exhausted. You even had firemen in Philadelphia. The fire was so intense that the sky glowed that the people could see it in New Haven, Connecticut and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You had firemen in Philadelphia who would pull their engines out thinking some suburb of Philly was burning and they didn't realize it was a city 100 miles or so to the north. So the fire burnt for... The main fire burned for about 10 hours and it destroyed an area probably as large, maybe a bit larger than the World Trade Center site. Maybe, you know, this third of a mile or so big, you know, across and up and down. It burnt 674 buildings. Of course, you have to realize a lot of the buildings were smaller at the point. They were two, three story buildings, but it wiped out a major business section of New York. The area became known as the Burnt District. And it was just, it was so devastating that you could stand where your business used to be and there used to be buildings in front. You could basically just see the river and you could see the ship sails, masts in the, in the distance. Given it was so, such an extraordinary fire and so visually immediate, were there any paintings or illustrations that were made of the event itself that you would like to tell us about? There were some. There was, um, immediately printers started making up prints. There was a Naples artist, Nicolino Calio, who did a series of gouaches and aquatints, very colorful images of the fire. There's a wonderful scene from across, from Brooklyn Heights across the river, where you have people standing on the shore and you just see this, this column of fire rising from New York City. He also did a series of paintings of the aftermath of the fire, the remains of places like the Merchants Exchange. Nathaniel Courier, um, Courier and Ives became very famous printers. He was a 22-year-old uh, printer at the point. He did a series. James Gordon Bennett, who had started the New York Herald, um, which eventually became one of the greatest newspapers in New York and in the world, had just started his newspaper six months or so earlier. And he, at great expense, ran a map and uh, engraving of the burnt, uh, of the fire along with an engraving of the Merchants Exchange. And what's fascinating about his account is that he did this form of reportage, which you didn't really see at the time. Of course, now you see it. It was He basically walked through the burnt district and wrote about what he was seeing, about merchants weeping or women huddling in you know, in the furs alongside their goods, young boys making fires to keep warm with the goods, the, the fine teas and the silks and the you know mahogany furniture from different uh, places, of people digging through, frantically looking for things, of people you know, stealing stuff. Um, he mentions this one elderly woman he saw her gathering from broken cast sugar. And he said, oh, she'll probably have a fine cup of tea tonight. You had others, you had maps immediately uh, made of it. There were pamphlets listing all the people who lost uh, businesses, where they were located. Then, of course, where people were being relocated to. Um, what I find fascinating was it was, it was as my, my title, Manhattan Phoenix, you know, somebody talking about how the city really rose from the ashes, where the city immediately started rebuilding Arthur Tappan, our silk merchant abolitionist. The day after the fire, he gathered with his workers and said, we're going to rebuild immediately. And he had the site cleared and they started to rebuild. You had others who immediately started, you know, finding places to set up their businesses and, you know, to sell things. And within a year, you have diarists like 
Philip Hone talk about how the city is just completely reborn, that they had basically, construction had started and it started to bring in serious uh, fire regulations and building codes. Not enough really for what you wanted, but there was also an attempt to try to straighten out streets and maybe make things wider because the fire, as it burned, one of the problems was the, the streets were so narrow and windy that it was hard really getting getting through it, especially if you have walls of fire, you can't really get around them as easily. And you have merchants who started to then, of course, build up. Of course, this is clearly not the only reason for New York's development. I just, I, I was fascinated by this as this point in time around which all these different forces happen. So of course you have the decision to build the aqueduct, which was the vote to build it was half a year earlier than the fire. And of course, seven years after the fire, water flowed into New York. You have, you know, merchants who are starting to build larger buildings and moving further north. You have the development of the city and people really started to look northward and to really to build. It's such a, it's, a, it's an absorbing piece of history. Um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to quote you at yourself and you, you write, for during these crucial decades as they quenched blazes, fought over the issues of slavery, what it meant to be a New Yorker and an American, the city's inhabitants, both rich and poor and native, born and new, newly arrived, turned their island city into the nation's commercial, financial and cultural centre. For like the phoenix, a mythical bird which consumes itself in flames, and from its ashes springs anew, Manhattan would each time emerge refreshed and stronger, following its fires, its plagues, its riots, and its development pushed farther up the island. It's one, Well, I hope you enjoyed that piece of writing. I thought it was very nicely put. And uh, the fire itself is, it is, it's a, it's kind of an epicentre in the book, and it's a catalytic event. And it is nice to find these moments in the development of something so interesting as New York City. I've got one last question, though, before I do let you go. And that's a little bit of material history, which might appeal to you. Um, I don't know if I warned you about this or not. But if you, if you could um, have an object of some kind from 1835 um, metaphorically given to you, a memento of this conversation or travel through the past, what would you like? I'd like one of the old wooden water pipes of New York, um, this antiquated system. The, the, the system they used to bring water, there was a series of pine logs basically hollowed out and snaked partly through the city and it brought water to people's houses. And it was started in 1798 by um, something called the Manhattan Company, which was founded by Aaron Burr and others. And they really weren't interested in bringing water to people's homes. They really had a clause in their in their in their filing when they created the corporation, which allowed them to exchange money because they couldn't there was only one state run bank, which was run by Hamilton and his people. And they started this and they were able to basically create a bank which became Chase Manhattan Bank. Of course it's Morgan uh Morgan's bank now. But these small logs and they occasionally dig them up and they, it was just low pressure. It just I just thought it would be fascinating to see one of these old logs. I've seen them in museums, little cut pieces of them and what have you. But it's for me, it, it talks about that old city and that point before the Croton Aqueduct at the time of the fire. You know, it really was a small city really struggling to try to, you know, survive and grow. And in a way, these little wooden pipes, you know, very much speak to that for me. Full of Full of powerful symbolism. It's a great choice. I really like it. And only remains for me to say, Daniel Levy, thank you very much for this illuminating, really fun conversation. I've learned a lot and I hope you've enjoyed it too. Thank you. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Daniel Levy about his absorbing new book, Manhattan Phoenix, The Great Fire of 1835 and the Emergence of Modern New York is just out now from Oxford University Press. It's full of fascinating insights and it's very, very much recommended by me. That's it for today. We'll be back next Tuesday as ever. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>